In the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul famously spoke of faith, hope, and charity, which William Tyndale translated as love. In the new heaven and new earth, love will remain, but there will be no need for hope. But what about faith? If we have faith, why do we need hope? St. Paul provides an answer in Romans, the crux of his theology. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace into which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Because we have faith, therefore we can hope for a good ending to our story. Paul says, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. The ending helps you make sense of the whole thing because we have faith. In Jürgen Moltmann's Theology of Hope, the ending is the light through which we see everything else. Hope and optimism are not the same. Optimism is the belief that things will be better in future. It is a cognitive belief. Hope is a quality of spirit, a feeling. You can have hope even if you're not optimistic. I think hope is a gift, often something you receive when you surrender, absolutely, not something you generate yourself. Most people in this world spend their time hoping that in the end all will be well. Because we don't see very far ahead, then we require faith in order to remain steadfast in the dark times. Faith is like trust. Faith endures when you can't imagine how things could be better. As Julian of Norwich famously said, all should be well, and all should be well, and all manner of things should be well. Faith gives you the courage to take the next step. It's closely related to grace, the understanding that whatever we do ourselves, it's nothing compared to what God can and will do. Sharing this vision of God's grace was George Fox, who in despair at the state of the world of 1647, wrote in his journal these words, I saw also that there was an ocean of darkness and death, but an infinite ocean of light and love, which flowed over the ocean of darkness. In that also I saw the infinite love of God, and I had great openings. A little over 300 years ago and across the Atlantic, Dr. Martin Luther King said something similar in reference to the struggle for civil rights and equality that he led. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Otherwise, all we're really left with is the secular version of hope, which is little more than optimism without certainty. But we have evidence that things were not always like this, and we hope that change is going to come. As Paul said, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. We thousands sit silently. As we sit there waiting for guidance, our worship is all about hope. It is about now, the imminence of God in the present moment. It can be about the future too, our hope that we will be given answers, even when we can't frame the right questions. I love that great phrase, proceed as the way opens. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And meanwhile, we trust to love, to keep us close while we are waiting. George Fox wrote to his parents in 1652, oh, be faithful. Look not back, nor be too forward, further than ye have attained, for ye have no time but the present time. Therefore, prize your time for your soul's sake. Listen to these words in Revelation, 
I am making all things new. Remember that George Fox particularly liked the book of Revelation or the confidence of Hebrews. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. So much of modern life is a utilitarian arithmetic. We compete for success. We look for justice, a fair return for our efforts. I do this, and therefore I deserve that. But God doesn't work like this at all. The message I take from the New Testament is that our efforts are not entered into a ledger like a profit and loss account. The repeated message of the gospel is it's not about our own efforts. I love the parable of the vineyard in Matthew. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. That's the topsy-turvy topology of the kingdom of God. It's not about just deserts. It's about love. The prodigal son is greeted with forgiveness, even though his brother thinks he doesn't deserve it. It's Mary who neglects her chores to sit with Jesus who gets it right. Think about that costly alabaster box of perfume. God is revealed through weakness, not strength. Through failure, not success. Through need, not independence. We welcome everyone to the great feast, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. We are looking for that of God in everyone, which isn't about everyone being a bit wonderful. It's about everyone being a vessel for God to act through. The kingdom of heaven is a way of acting now, a way of being in this world. It means the transformed human condition, a humanity free of selfishness.